going to begin the live transcription, which you can um, turn off if you don't want to see it. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Experimental Film and Media Studies Virtual Book Talk with Fred Camper in conversation with Ken Eisenstein on Fred Camper's forthcoming book, Seeking Brackage, from Eyewash Books. My name is Shira Siegel, and I'm here with the Experimental Film and Media Studies um, Media Scholarly Interest Group co-chairs, Oksana Shavranova and Srijita Banerjee, to present today's talk. This talk is co-sponsored by the Cinema Arts Scholarly Interest Group at SCMS, and will include a presentation by Fred, uh, followed by a discussion with Ken and a Q&A. Before we dive in, I want to announce the XFM Graduate Student Essay Award and the new XFM Research in Progress Coffee Hour series titled Groundworks. I will uh, put those in the chat so, and I will also announce them and heavily advertise them uh, next week starting on Monday. Boom. Okay. It's hard to know where to begin when introducing a figure like Fred Camper, whose body of work includes formal criticism and analysis, frame enlargements, and archives of writings by, about, and with Brackage. I'll include a few of the many available links to Camper's online archives of material in the chat for easy reference, but I would also direct you to his careful liner notes in the Criterion Collections by Brackage Anthology. And now, of course, to his forthcoming collection of writings titled Seeking Brackage, which is also in the chat. Fred is an artist and photographer. He was once a filmmaker, and he remains a prolific freelance writer, critic, and journalist, as well as an instructor of art, photography, and film. He's the co-founder of the Chicago Art Critics Association. And, uh, oh, I lost myself, sorry. Um, oh, and he's a member of the International Association of Art Critics. He's received the Exceptional Achievement in Criticism Award from Cinemarati Association of Online Film Critics. And he also received the Film Preservation Honor from the Anthology Film Archives for his writing and film criticism. I'll go ahead and put more about him in uh, the chat for you. Um, I want to thank Fred for his generosity and kindred spirit in talking with us today about the new collection, as well as his thoughts on where Brackage and cinema stand today. I also want to briefly introduce Ken Eisenstein from the Film and Media Studies Program at Bucknell University, who will be our respondent following Fred's presentation and whose bio I'll include in the chat. His work has appeared in The Moving Image, The Criterion Collection, Found Footage Magazine, MIT's October Files, among others. His work remains a steady source of inspiration and poetic scholarship that I especially appreciate. So thank you, Ken. With that, I will hand the stage over to you, Fred. Uh, you'll talk for about 20 minutes, and then that'll be followed by Ken's commentary, questions, and discussion. While this is happening, feel free to jot questions or comments in the chat, and then we will queue those up and address them in the Q&A and open discussion portion of today's session. Well, thanks a lot, and thanks for proposing this. I wouldn't have wouldn't have occurred to me. Uh, we connected when. Uh, Shira uh, sent me a LinkedIn invite, which I usually enjoyed, but I know I, which I usually ignore. But I noticed that she was involved in film and in avant-garde film, and so I accepted, and that led to this. So I guess we shouldn't disparage all social networks all of the time. Um, I want to start uh, by explaining the origins of my writing about brackage because it's a little bit different than the way that most people who write seriously about film got started. I was 15, growing up in Manhattan. Uh, this is a story I've told before, so I apologize to those who, there are a few people who have heard it more than once. Growing up in Manhattan, somewhat of a snob culturally. I didn't go to movies. I think I'd gone to a revival of Gone with the Wind when I was 14, uh, which was supposed to be one of the great movies, and that convinced me not to go to others. Um, and a friend of mine said he'd gone to an experimental film and he liked it and he'd wondered if I'd like to come with him to another screening of it. And I had no idea what that was, except I'd had a little exposure to advanced art. I wasn't shocked when it was silent and when there was no plot. 
Uh, it was Twice a Man, later had a soundtrack by Gregory Markopoulos. I completely loved it. That was a sort of transformative road to Damascus moment for me. And quickly I was reading Jonas Mekison, The Village Voice and Film Culture, and found my way to the name of Brackett almost immediately. Uh, and was able to see his films at the beginning of 1964, when I had just turned 16, at a screening at NYU that was not very well publicized, according to Hollis Frampton, who complained in a letter I read decades later to a friend, the young Hollis Frampton was hoping to see Brackage's films, and he would missed that screening, so he had yet to see any. Uh, and I'd found it in one of these little listings in The Voice that just had a list of things. Um, uh, and so that got me started. Um, by the middle of the summer, I found his films totally astounding. Um, I don't know intellectually that I was very advanced in terms of understanding what he was doing. I felt immediately a connection to Bach when I saw Mothlight at that first screening. And what I describe is having my eyesight rearranged. It felt like his films were sort of scouring out every surface of the world, reaching to every corner, including the darkest ones, and somehow making everything visible in a way that hadn't been possible for me before. And so I thought this, was, this work was transformative and other people should see it. And at the same time, I was starting to discover, again, via a few friends who knew more than I did, filmmakers like F.W. Murnau and Robert Bresson and John Ford and Alfred Hitchcock, and discovering some of the same formal integrity in their films that I was finding in avant-garde film. And so suddenly there seemed to be this whole field that was totally misunderstood in my opinion, and in my opinion, partly still is, um, and that needed both exposure and explication. So this was the beginning of the 60s and idealism and changing the world were not unknown. And I started at MIT, which I went to in the fall of 64, a film society with some friends. And we very quickly were showing Brackage films and eventually others, uh, you know, such as Douglas Sirk that might not have made Brackage very happy if he knew that, that we were also showing those. Um, and, and what you did with the film society, the College Film Society movement could, I could talk a great deal about it, but it partly proceeded because there were no film classes in most schools. And it was a way of learning yourself. There was also no video. You had, ran a film society and you got a print and you could look at it three times uh, rather than just at your showing. So it was a way of learning about film on your own. And, uh, uh, and that's what we did. And we also had program notes, which many college film societies did at the time. Uh, uh, and I wrote some of them, and that's how my writing on Brackage got started. So, I mean, it was 17 and 18 that is where the book begins. And, and that also tells you something about the writing quality, that it's not all going to be very good. I don't think I'm a particularly good prose stylist in any case. I, I think I'm better than I was 50 years ago. Um, and so that also goes to the way the book was constructed. These program notes were written right before the show, typed directly onto Mimeo stencils, no revision. I've allowed myself a few small revisions in the text as, as it's published, but mostly not. I mean, I didn't try to rewrite things to make them clearer. And the book will also be repetitious for the same reason um, that I'm returning to the same films again and again. Thanks very much to Scott McDonald of Iowash Press, whose idea the book was and who did most of the work. I never would have thought of this myself. Um, uh, I could never get a collection together anyway of, of, of various kinds of writing. But the point is, I was writing as an enthusiast, hoping to bring the films to other people, hoping, I dare say, to, to help change the world. The second part did not work out, as Brackage himself, who had similar ambitions acknowledged late in his life, saying, well, we didn't succeed in changing the world. What did happen is that people at the MIT Film Society would come and squint up at the screen trying to figure out what was going on and then pick up the program notes and try to read those. And sometimes they stayed, sometimes they walked out. Um, uh, it was at the beginning of the 60s, a time when people were open to such things. And it also should be said that the media landscape was very different and far more homogenous. A kid today, if you show them a Brackage film, they've probably seen 
20 imitations on YouTube and in TV commercials, and it won't look on a superficial level all that different, although it is going to be hugely different if, if, you know, if, if, if it gets examined with care. So aside from the flaws and, and limitations of the book, um, I hope that it still helps to bring Brackage's films to more people. And I'm hoping to arrange some screenings in connection with its publication, which is one reason why the official publication date isn't until early January, January 14th, the 90th anniversary of Brackage's birth. It looks like there'll be a couple in New York. I haven't really tried very hard in other places, but I, you know, I'm hoping that the book, the usual line is that you do appearances to publicize the book. And I suppose I'm doing that, but I'm also hoping the book will help publicize the films in a way of getting screenings. And, and of course, I will not accept digital screenings. Uh, you don't need me uh, to do that. The other thing about the book that's worth saying is that it has 56 frame enlargements, which I had scans that I made myself over a period of 20 years uh, when I had access to prints. And um, they're always, always at least two frames long. This was a belief that Brackage had and Marilyn had and I has and I have that his films are not very well rendered by frame enlargements, even if the two frames are identical. And often the scans will I'll try to choose the scans that will show a cut. But even if the two frames are identical, it gives a sense of the moving rhythm of a brackage film uh, uh, and, and the constant change. OK, so now to come to brackage himself. Um, in the Introduction to the Criterion Collection, which is the uh, one of the first essays in the book, there's a little section in which I list his influences. Um, two writers, Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein, two painters, J.M.W. Turner and Jackson Pollock, two composers, Johann Sebastian Bach and Olivier Messiaen, and two choreographers, Martha Cunning, Martha Graham and Merce Cunningham. And I wanted to mention how this list was constructed, although somewhere in the book I do mention it. It's not in the original essay. This is not my list. I phoned up Brackage and said, you get two of each. Who were the most influential writers, painters, and composers? And he added choreographers. Um, but the point in, in telling you that is that these are all artists whose work has great internal complexity. You can't understand Gertrude Stein without reading a chunk of it because the parts relate to the whole rhythmically. Same is true of Ezra Pound. Same is true of listening to Johann Sebastian Bach or Olivier Messiaen. And the same is true in the paintings of Turner and Pollock. They, they, this is an art that depends on complex relationships between its parts. And that's something that is less fashionable today to the point where I'll often introduce Brackage or sometimes other filmmakers um, by playing students a Bach fugue. I pick a short one. It doesn't seem to be working very well, but my point is that, that the kind of attention every second, attention to every second, to every element of this work that's required in listening to a fugue will serve you well in viewing most of the films that I, that I love the most, although not necessarily all of them. So Brackage's films are obviously characterized by an extreme visual beauty. Um, that should be easy to see. What's harder to see is how unbalanced they are, how strange they are, how unobvious their form is. And this is an evolution that I trace somewhat in the book from talking about how certain early films have a very pat beginning and ending, the hand-painted birth films, byline liar triangular, begins with a curtain opening of black and ends with a curtain closing. Um, as an abstract filmmaker, Brackage had to make his own way. Uh, the earlier abstract filmmakers did not serve as particularly good roadmaps for him, except perhaps as, as things to, to make, to do differently. Um, and so, so his early attempts at relatively abstract filmmaking were relatively systematic. And a key point that I make in the book, continually returning to the riddle of Lumen, which I consider one of his greatest and major films, is that he avoids systematic structures. 
And he increasingly learned how to do that. So the later films, starting with The Riddle of Lumen, do not have a bang ending. The way that in a, in a way the art of vision does, although it's a sort of fade out disintegrating ending, but but it's it's a, an apocalyptic one. Um, instead, he finds a lack of pattern. He celebrates lack of obvious pattern. He celebrates surprise. He celebrates changes of one kind or another. The films never come to rest. And there's a wonderful passage. I I, I want to welcome Scott McDonald here. There's a wonderful passage in his terrific Brackage interview which startled me at first. Brackage talks about how he was diagnosed with a kind of wandering eye syndrome so that he can't, his, one of his eyes doesn't come to rest and he's constantly assembling a view from many different smaller views, almost like an excuse for his style, uh, it sounds like. And at first it annoyed me as being kind of literal, but there's something profound there connected with the way that his films don't come to rest, connected with an observation he attributed to Gertrude Stein that there is no space, there's only time. There is space, I think, if you like Kenji Mizuguchi's films as much as I do, but not so much in Brackage's films. Time is, is absolutely important. His films feel at their best like they're falling off the edge, like every shape that you see is somehow endangered. And that gets, that gets truer and truer as he goes along. I wanted to talk specifically about a couple of films without According to offer a big analysis. One of them, and, and two that I've chosen are quite well known, so probably many people here have seen them many times. One is Window Water Baby Moving, and I want to make one comment about it. It's a linear film, in a way, of the story of the birth of Brackage's first child by natural childbirth, but it's not completely linear. There are what you might call flash forwards or prolepses early in the film. And there are flashbacks you could call later in the film, although I don't think it's a good idea to call them that. One obvious explanation for this is that Brackage is making a film about his own consciousness of the birth as it was happening, as he anticipated, and as he remembers it. And so instead of a linear story, it makes complete sense to mention different kinds of time. But there's another reason, and that I wanted to mention. And in order to do that, I'm going to share a document with you. Uh, I guess the whole document doesn't fit on the screen, but you can look it up. It's a Shakespeare sonnet. In case your translation of Roman numerals ability is limited, it's sonnet 73. And I want to call your attention to the first two lines. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang. And to complete the quatrain upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. The bare ruined choirs are apparently a reference to the ruins of monasteries dis destroyed almost a century earlier when Henry VIII took England out of the Catholic Church. And so there would be open monasteries sitting with, with boughs hanging. But the part that, that is relevant here, I think, is when yellow leaves or none or few do hang. That's out of order. Why not while well, yellow leaves or few or none? And I read commentaries, and the one that struck me the most as, as both at first odd and maybe silly, but then maybe actually really true, the writer said this is, calls attention to the reader and makes the reader more active in having to figure out the temporal order. And that is a major aspect of Brackett's films. They require an active viewer. Um, they require an involved viewer. The viewer participates in the making of the film. And in that sense, they differ from those aspects of, of traditional Hollywood film that allow you to just sit back and get taken on a thrill ride. And just without veering too far into Hollywood, here's where I disagree with Brackage. He would agree with that and say he was addicted to it. And I would say that some films that do that can also be great works of art, but not because they do that for other reasons. So Hitchcock Psycho would be a go-to example of a film that has an enormous amount of depth. But also, you know, you can just sit back and get pulled on this horror thrill ride or, or whatever, if you like. Um, so that's that's one one point to make about Brackage is that he's not doing something completely new. He's doing something that many arts have done in, in terms of making themselves complex. 
And that's really true of the eight artists who he cited. I'm not an expert on Martha Graham and Merce Cunningham, but I think it's true of them. It's certainly true of the other six of which I'm not expert either, but I've seen and read plenty. Um, uh, they require a really complex and, and uh, careful involvement. Now, moving right along, another film I wanted to discuss, even better known perhaps than uh, Window Water Beam Moving, is Moth Light. And in order to do that, I have something to show you. So this is from my website. Shira kindly referred to it. I should mention that it has not been updated for the most part. So there are going to be broken links on the brackage pages and all kinds of things. But there is a big collection of stills. Nowhere near everything that I have, but there is a collection. And these are six scripts from Mothlight, selected, by the way, in chronological order. That is the beginning of the film. And this comes late in the film, although it's not the end. And you can enlarge them to see them in, in detail. And here's what you should notice. Um, of course, this is, a, in case you don't know, this is a collage film that was made without a camera. Uh, it was hard to get it printed in order to show it because the pack was so thick. But um, if you know anything about film projection, you will know that when this is shown as a film, that box is one frame, and this box will be the next frame. And a certain amount of continuity is achieved in projecting a strip like this because you'll see some lines continuing. But the point is that it's partly a film about film projection and about the paradoxes of film projection and about the difference between nature and the rectilinear forms of our culture. It's also Brackage's attempt to explore an alternative kind of seeing. He referred to it, refers to it as a moth, what a moth might see from life to death, at least in part. And, and so it's an example of his attempt to explore alternative forms of eyesight. Um, uh, and so it's doing a couple of different things at once, including requiring an active viewer who ideally knows something about film projection. And then to move on quickly to the third film that I wanted to mention, which is The Riddle of Lumen. Here I don't have strips. I do want to point out this one frame enlargement, which occurs very early in the film which I don't know that anyone else has talked about. I've always taken it as a, a joke of Brackage on himself. A little kid is looking at a book, a picture book with titles. The still is very poor quality. The film will be better. Upside down. In other words, this is a kid who hasn't lear yet learned to read and is just looking at colors, uh, something that Brackage himself would, of course, appreciate and praise. Now, let's see. What's wrong here? Okay. I wanted to mention these two strips as examples of the anti-systematic move that Brackage's films take. Um, a round bucket is not rhymed with another round bucket, but with two. A rectangle of light becomes a receding rectangle of light receding into depth. And, and this is exactly what happens. He's no longer relying on, on over obvious and systematic forms of organization, not that I would ever have called them over obvious, but his later films proceed in that direction. Um, now, the most famous of Brackage's statements is the opening paragraph of Metaphors on Vision. And I, I want to display that again. People here doubtless know it well. It's an invocation toward trying to discover the world of childhood seeing in which we don't own, know objects with their name by their names. Brackage's idea being that if you don't own objects by their name, you can be much more imaginative in seeing them. Um, and this has been disputed and argued with incorrectly, I think, because Brackage himself says in the same text a little bit later that he realizes you can never go back and rediscover childhood seeing. But the point is, not so much childhood seeing, but adventure in perception. Uh, imagine that we can encounter objects not by their names, but as adventures in perception. And that's what his films do. 
um, in classes, I sometimes will take a look at the most boring chair in the classroom and talk about different ways you can see it. You can start to notice that it does have a texture, even if it's black. You can start to notice that from different angles, light is reflected off of it differently. You can start to reimagine the shapes of the legs and of the back by seeing it from different angles. This is absolutely key to Brackage. He once said at a screening, because he appeared with his films at screenings as a way to make money, he once said something that I found rather touching, even if it seemed a little bit simple too, which is if one person leaves the theater and sees the, the street in a new way, I will have achieved my goal. That's not verbatim. He, he doesn't usually say I, I will have achieved my goal, but that was the meaning. So he's trying to help the people discover new and more imaginative ways of seeing is what I would say is going on in his work. Um, that's how they appeal directly to the viewer. That's what they ask of the viewer. Um, and just to continue my interest in 17th century British poetry, which is not nearly as deep as you might think, um, I will show you one more poem. This is a very short excerpt from a much longer poem by a little known poet named George Wither. Um, in my former, and Philarte is a name of a fictional character that's meant to be a sensitive person. And Philarte is praising poetry. So the her in line two is poetry. <clears throat> in my former days of bliss, her divine skill taught me this, that from everything I saw, I could some invention draw and some pleasure to her height and raise pleasure to her height through the meanest object's sight. Poetry will allow you to see even the meanest object with pleasure. And of course, Brackage's films are full of ordinary objects that he, I, I would say, raises to, you know, to height. Now I realize I'm about a minute or two over 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but I'm almost done. Um, I'll just say that it's my belief, without justifying it further, that the evolution that I'm talking about toward the less and less obvious reached its height in the early to mid 80s with the Romans, Arabics, and Egyptian series films. Those are my idea of his greatest films. I think later his films are just as great. Uh, I mean, he doesn't go downhill, but they, they completed the evolution, not away from naming objects, but away from the known, the familiar towards the unknown. And this brings up the new essay in the book. There are a couple of new ones, but the one that I, feel is most important, which is called Still Seeking Brackage, which comes at the end of the part uh, of the first part of the book of the general essays. Um, and there's a much longer version of this because it's something that you can find in many arts, that the artist statement takes the form of, my art isn't this, but it's that. And Brackage's own metaphors on Disney statement is one example. My art is not object knowing, knowing objects by its name, but adventures in perception. The examples that I give in addition to Brackage, Cezanne says, essentially, my painting is not the projection of emotions, but painting as well as I can and letting the, the viewer find emotions in there. Wallace Stevens, being a true negationist, says it's nothing. Uh, we cannot name the objects. And Gertrude Stein has a wonderful essay called uh, What Are Masterpieces and Why Are There So Few of Them? Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. If there's a Stein expert here, uh, please tell me, maybe not in this meeting, but soon enough. But it seems to me that what she's saying is that when she is the person who her little dog knows, that is in her personality, she cannot write a masterpiece. She has to be an entity, not an identity. Um, uh, and this is an argument against, so all of these artists are arguing against the ordinary life scenario for art, and instead for art as something different and special. Rilke has a poem that in which he reads a sculpture as saying, you must change your life without quite explaining why. Um, uh, there are many, many other examples. Uh, 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 Robert Bresson, to take a filmmaker, 
says, um, camera and tape recorder take me far away from the intelligence which complicates everything. And this is after a whole book of aphorisms decrying ordinary acting. Um, and Wallace Stevens too, in the poem that I quote, uh, doesn't seem to like intelligence very much. And the point here is to separate, to, to make an argument against the current uh, trend. And, and I mean, I think anything can be art, including the most mundane looking autobiography of how I became who I am. Uh, there are no rules, but I wanna argue in particular in favor of the idea that art takes you to a different place than that of ordinary life, um, a place which can transform you uh, uh, and transform your thinking and your seeing. And I think I'm almost done. I just wanna make one further mention of, about consumerism, the way that our consumer culture turns everything into objects, the way that films present themselves as objects of pleasure that stimulate your, and I'm talking about commercial films now, that stimulate your endorphins so that you'll buy another ticket, uh, but that leave you with nothing afterwards. Um, this is true, as just as true of social media. Um, Facebook famously chose, uh, cho chose to let you see things that would make you angry because you stay on the platform longer and shows the like button because people like to be liked. Um, uh, whereas the best art I think gives you an extremely complex experience in time, the beginning of an exploration, not an object to leave behind once, but an object to return to, to see all the other films of that filmmaker as much as you can as part of this journey of discovery. Because for me, although art can have great effects in affirming who you are and in helping you find your identity, especially for those people whose identity has long been disparaged, it can also transform you and change you in all kinds of great ways. And now I am really out of time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. That was wonderful. Um, I will pass the baton to Ken, if I may. <clears throat> sure. Uh, hello, everyone. It's incredible to be here um, with so many amazing people on this call, uh, especially Patrick Friel, who I haven't seen in a while and um, was part of how I met Fred Camper, I think probably, uh, in my years in Chicago, starting at the Art Institute in 1998. This will be a very brief story just to say that the thing that has been the most pleasant memory of reading through this massive book over the last few weeks um, is thinking about when I used to uh, screen films for Fred that he was going to be reviewing for the Chicago Reader. And I'd always be up on the 12th or 13th floor of the 112 Michigan Ave building, and I'd hear Fred's bike shoes clicking on the hard hallways as he walked toward the uh, screening room. And there's something totally overwhelming about Brackage's life being folded into Fred's life and in some ways into some smaller portion of my life and to be reading through this. Um, and maybe uh, one place to start is my love of extremes, which I take Fred to be an extreme person. And I just wanted to share this one passage from uh, a night, one of, well, I'll say things more cohesively in a second, but just in terms of this um, response that Fred just gave us a snapshot of in terms of the things that he loves and the things that he wants to share but also the things that he will admit and the things that I think he wants to happen to everyone, but that do happen to him. And this is in his review of a Super 8 show um, in 1976 at Anthology, uh, where towards the end, Fred writes uh, about Brackage's film Absence, which I have not seen, but it is for Absence that I reserve my most extreme comments. No film, has involved me more in its watching, terrified every fiber of my being, totally deranged my perception, and more deeply, everything that I've come to think of as my thought processes. That someone would be so pleased by this derangement, this terror, um, I realized in reading this passage, oh, this is, this is where I get so many of my own <laughs> Um, personality traits from, I think. 
in having known Fred for a couple of years back at the turn of the 21st century. Um, maybe this is a very strange thing in that none of you have read this book. Many of you, I'm sure, have followed Fred's writing over the years. And so there's also a portion of this in terms of the Chicago years that was extremely interesting for me to reread, having read these things in the Chicago Reader as they came out. Um, I guess I want to do two brief things and then have some questions for Fred and then open things up for questions from everyone. And the first is maybe it, it actually uh, comes very interestingly out of the Shakespeare sonnet and temporality, um, this book has a very strange temporal order. Um, and in that it moves first really starts with sort of uh, section one that begins mainly with articles written that are sort of summary pieces and some of them as bracket after Brackage had already died. Um, it wiggles around a little in that. And then we move chronologically through these MIT Film Society notes in section two and other writings for other venues. And I'll, I'll especially be curious to ask Fred something about this um, difference of who he was writing for at different times. Um, and then a sort of final section that has some wrap up things, but that really end up having some fascinating ways of referring back to things that had been come up earlier. So in the introduction, Fred says he is pretty sure no one's going to read this book straight through, um, which is what I did and what I recommend. And of course, straight through because of these temporal problems isn't straight through. You're going to move through different years at different times. But there is something really wonderful about sometimes being lost in terms of where did Fred come up with this interest or this idea? So in what is probably, I think in a way, his most major essay, um, which appeared in the Chicago Review in 2001, he takes up this idea of the films that he's mainly discussing, and especially uh, A Child's Garden and The Serious Sea, and takes the idea of the garden and the sea as two really emblematic things for Brackage. And he traces them through different films where these images have appeared, and that you know they define some of this idea of um, what you might try to possess or what you might try to hold on to or what you might try to control in your own garden and what you have no control over out at sea. And I just wanted to uh, object to Fred's dismissal of his writing and read um, two passages, one from 2002, one from 2021, that both touch on this idea of the sea, um, but that I think... Um, Fred, you've undersold your skill here. Uh, so let me start with this one from 2002. Uh, the imagery in the Vancouver Island films so often appears out of and then returns to darkness that even something as material as the sea begins to seem like a spider web spun over a void. This is an amazing image to me of a spider web that might tremble, but a spider web that is solid material, not water. And then the idea of the sea seeming like this um, spider web spun over a void. This is an honest reflection of the physical nature of the film image, which is cast by a fraction of a second of projector light passing through dyes embedded in a narrow strip of plastic. It also acknowledges images as mental constructs, as fragile moments in time that glimpsed for an instant will never return. So the endless rocking of the sea, the spider web from the garden, which is where you're more likely to see it than standing on a shore, but Fred has made this metaphor of the sea and its foam and all of its things spinning a web, but that that is also something that's run through a projector that has a comparison to the frame of film, the strip of film, but also the mental image and the response to a film or the experience of seeing a film, or as I'm gonna to come to in a second, uh, the whole you know incredibly um, knotted issue of all objects, but I think this is a line somewhere, you know, all objects in Brackage films are not the objects, they're the objects in Brackage's, how those objects appear in Brackage's mind, in his memory, in his imagination. So 
just an incredible um, piece right there. This is on page 131 for when you get your copy. Um, and I wanted to compare it to 20 years later, this passage, which will also in a sense summarize some of what Fred was sharing with us a minute ago um, in terms of, it, it will return to the ocean, but I also wanted to, you mentioned this a teaching example of the chair and um, you have an example of it here that's a little different in terms of how Brackage might see a chair. So just this one more passage here to give you again, a flavor of some of the ideas, but also uh, that one I think is the most beautifully written passage in terms of the spider web and the sea. Um, but here, what do we find in a mature Brackage film? And this, so this is from the new essay for this book, Still Seeking Brackage. What do we find in a mature Brackage film? The aspiration to know objects not by their name should be seen not just as an invocation against naming, but also against knowing an object by its use. You do not have to think the word chair when you see a chair to think about sitting down in it. But in the brackage underexposed out of focus rapidly moving version of a chair, one is also discouraged from thinking of its uses and instead wonders if the filmmaker is imagining it as an undersea monster, a nude body, a tree, or a landscape, or an absence, all the while knowing that it is no one of those things. The viewer is immersed in a sea of uncertainties, an ocean of what we cannot know. These are two just, uh, unbelievable passages, Fred, and thank you so much for writing them and for sharing them here. Um, what can I say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me um, think about how, what I, so I, this was just to give you a taste of the book, but also to, of the writing, but also to set up this really interesting issue of time. And I don't know where, let me try to frame these as discrete questions, Fred. Um, Okay, so one thing would be, let me ask a question about your venues over the years, which have changed. There's a really incredible um, difference between your writing for the reader, which I assume, and I also kind of want to hear about the process of reviewing films. I mean, you know, there, there are certain instances where you will pick, I mean, here we were reading some images that you've conjured yourself, but there are also times that you deal very concretely with Brackage's images, um, again, from the Chicago Review essay in terms of uh, the sun reflected on the water and underneath is a starfish, and you talk about these two solar bodies or uh, in ellipses reel three the bird and the white scratch on the film and the, the wings and the light going through the wings and the light coming through the scratch so there are these elements of extremely intense um image analysis but there's something really curious to me about the one piece here for art forum the 19 from the 1973 issue with eisenstein and brackage um that comparison and your essay in there is on um West, uh, Western history and the riddle of Lumen. And you start with, which is the only time I think you do this in the book, a shot list, a counting of frames, a counting of time in terms of how long shots last and a much more in a sense detailed analysis of the editing structure than appears anywhere else. And maybe this is a way to make concrete the difference between what I assume, you know, for the Chicago reader, films are coming into town, Patrick is probably previewing them for you. So maybe you're watching them once or twice and taking notes on them and then and then writing about them. And not once. Sorry? Not more than once. Yeah. Okay. Well, I said once or twice. I don't know. Maybe it was also more than twice. But I'm just curious about the difference. What what how do you account for the difference of working method? in 1972 when I assumed you were working on the Western history piece. And I mean, I, I was not, sorry, not how do you account for it? One is journalism and one is, you know, uh, uh, this more detailed um, scholarship, even though you start the book with the idea that you 
or an enthusiast, not a scholar. And I'm really curious about if you've missed writing le the way that you did for art form in that piece. Well, the art form art article is curious because I think the second Western, Western history just isn't very good. I think I missed a lot of what the film is actually doing uh, thematically. Um, I certainly believe in shot lists and in detailed analysis of shot lists. I just don't think I did such a great job there. It also proceeded from the climate of the time. Annette Michelson was the editor. Shot lists were uh, common. Um, and, and I'm sure I was somewhat influenced by that. Um, for the reader, obviously, I can't do a shot list. Mm -hmm. um, I probably preferred in some ways writing for the reader because I thought with the reader, I might reach the proverbial 15-year-old whose life might get changed or a 65-year-old. Whereas for our forum, that seemed less likely. Um, you know, it was going to be read, if at all, by art, art, art cognio sentais of various kinds. Um, so, I mean, it's true that things change. For the reader, it's a general interest audience. I had a very good editor for most of the time I was there. Uh, named Laura Molzon. And so the, uh, you know, we could work together on improving my writing, but obviously I couldn't go too far off the deep end uh, into abstractions for the reader. Um, so that's a difference. I miss both. I mean, both kinds of writing are, are, are fine. And the, the essay still seeking brackage that you referred to, that's what I, the way I wanted to write. That's probably it because nobody was, you know, telling me what to do. Um, uh, so that's probably closer, and I think it has elements of both detailed analysis and, and uh, you know, and something more general. So yeah, I, and part for me, I mean, again, you know, the, there is that obvious difference of writing for the reader, but there's an element in which it also seems to be something that you think. I mean, there's something amazing about how you are writing about the experience of the films for yourself. And there is something, so even in your discussion, which you've given us a little snapshot of, but there's a more elaborate discussion of why film strips instead of stills. And the and there does seem to be something, um, you know, sh shot lists are in a way like two on the, sh they're, they're, I mean, let me see how to phrase this. There's something, um, they're not the experience of projection. They're not, the film in motion, they're not the ideas that they've generated in you, they're not the rhythms overall. Um, you have this, you know, just to take a slightly different example, uh, in parts of your criticism of Jim Shedden's documentary, you wonder about showing clips that don't give a sense of a complete rhythm. And you're like, you know, you point out there were very, very short films that could have been included whole, yeah, and therefore given an entire sense. And there's a way that you're writing for the reader. There, there was a. It, it seems like a very nice natural match in your interest in this overall experience. In a way, comes out more in the reader pieces than in the art forum piece. Oh, that, that's that's true. That's true. That's exactly right. I, and I, I think I think I'd be capable of doing a better job with shop than I did in art forum. So I think it's partly just a reaction to that. Also, the second part of the art forum thing, which is the longer of the two, is by far my preferred part, comparing anticipation of the night to the riddle of Lumen. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to, my greatest passion would be to convince other people mm -hmm. of the greatness of these films. And that can be done in different ways, depending on who you're writing for. So. And maybe just one more question here, because I see the time, um, which also has to do with this sort of difference between spe specificity and also um, more generalized things, and then also your working method. Especially in some of the late reader pieces, you're often referring to phone calls with Brackage, and you have quotations from things he has said. And I'm just curious about your process of um, were those phone calls recorded? Were you taking notes? There's something very specific about giving us quotes from Brackage instead of paraphrasing, you know, something he said. And I mean, this is a small question that I think could lead into something more about 
your connections to him personally, time you've spent with him. I mean, you mentioned the story of seeing some of the um, Polavision films. Yep. Can you tell, I mean, so I, I, I mean, well, you have this resistance in some cases to the biographical in, in, in including it in parts of your analysis, though, of course, there are times you certainly bring it in. Um, though some, interestingly, sometimes like, you know, you'll be talking about a child in a film and then a few paragraphs later, incidentally, this is his grandchildren in yeah. uh, hindering, I think. So just a, if that makes sense as a question, I mean, literally, are, did, what was the transcription process of the phone calls in terms of being able to then quote them in the reader and maybe let that expand into some choice moments of your relationship to Stan Brackage? Well, unfortunately, they weren't recorded. I don't think I had the ability to do that. I did have a habit when writing for the reader, where I also wrote a lot of art reviews, with doing phone interviews and typing. And my guess is that I've got files typed from at least some of the calls with Brackage. Um, the typing is not going to be super accurate. Um, uh, there's a, I quote Sidney in, in this book as saying there are no really significant insights into Brackage that he hasn't in some way said himself. And I think that's true. And so I relied a lot on things that he said as cues for developing my thinking about him. Um, it's true I had a long relationship with him. I'm not going to claim to be a close friend. And after he died, some other people did claim to be close friends who I think were not. And I don't want to, not, not that he's, you know, not that anyone's asked me for my autograph because I knew Brackage, but I don't want to misrepresent anything. But I was in touch with him essentially every year or more often. He taught in Chicago for part of the time I was there. So I would see him there. I visited him a few times in Colorado. Um, there were phone calls and letters as well. Um, uh, it never influenced me that much. Um, it, it probably helped that he tended to write, and not only to me, but to other critics as well. This was the most fantastically great piece of, of writing on my film that I've ever read, and hence one of the greatest pieces of film criticism ever, or something like that. So Breckage, you know, could overpraise and manage to overpraise himself too. And I think he would smile at that. The review of the Shedden book, I'm very hard on the film, the Shedden film, I'm very hard on the film, and also make the point that Brackage is really weird and maybe a little bit creepy. And I was so happy when he read that review and said, you're right. So, I mean, he's a person who did have a fair amount of self-awareness, at least at times. Wonderful. Why don't we shift, thank you so much to you both for this. Why don't we shift to um, a larger conversation with those who are present? Feel free to raise your hand or put your questions uh, in the chat if you would like that. And I'll remove our pins so we can see each other. Can, could I start off? Please, David. Yes. <clears throat> that uh, Fred's talk, that first half hour, I thought was absolutely magnificent. Um, I'm so pleased that it's been recorded, uh, preserved. Uh, what a fantastic introduction to Brackage it is. And I hope uh, many people will use it in Brackage classes as an introduction to what they may expect in a course on STAM. I thought it was absolutely fabulous. And uh, it fills me with both elation and despair because I'll never be able to be as perceptive and as attentive and as intelligent as Fred uh, has been for these past 50 years or so. It amazes me that at 15, he was able to process Brackage films in the way he described. And I'm not sure that I could do better now at 75 than he was able to do at 15. Uh, so for me, it was uh, uh, really uh, um, uh, an inspiration. But I'd like to say something. It was an inspiration in what it allowed me to do in the future with Brackage. But for me, it was also an inspiration in something like the texture of Fred's own discourse. And as well as addressing the insightfulness that uh, the insights that Fred makes available, 
I'd like to remark upon the, the beauty of Fred's own discourse, the kind of measured cadence with which he spoke. Um, um, it, unlike the way he talks about brackage, he didn't really zap backwards and forwards in time. Uh, the un unfolding of his discourse was, was uh, so eloquent, precise, but it did make me think of the relationship between past, present, and future in Brackage's filmmaking, in that the kind of verbal intelligence of Fred's own language was such that you kind of felt that he, at any moment in a sentence, he knew where he was in relation to previous moments in that sentence and later moments in that sentence. As if he could see his whole discourse and at any moment within it, articulate its place in respect to the whole. So, um, uh, so I'll shut up, but I wanna say, first of all, thank you, Fred, for the inspiration of your insights into brackage, but also thank you uh, for your uh, display of beautiful, beautiful prose. As I said at the beginning, you are the man. It was just wonderful for me. Well, thank you. I'm blushing. Uh, uh, uh... Uh, and I thank you very much, <laughs> and I hope to hear from somebody who thought I was a stinky speaker and has suggestions for the future. Or not, but I mean, I, I, don't, <laughs> want to, I don't want to discourage criticism. Mm. I'm always mm -hmm. open to it. That's lovely. Thank you, David. Thank you, Fred. The floor is open, so feel free to um, just unmute yourselves if you'd like. Maybe while people are thinking, I'll just point to two interesting, I think, um, or a question if if you, Fred, if these are things you, how you feel about them. Um, in terms of the Pittsburgh trilogy, there's an interesting example of, and you had talked about this a little in, um, I mean, you talk about the selection of stills and sometimes, or strips, and sometimes there's a film, and this comes up in the chapter on the governor, uh, a film that you think is an interesting, and much, much lesser known parallel to the Pittsburgh documents or the Pittsburgh trilogy. But there, even though active scene comes up a little bit, the Pittsburgh films are really something you don't touch on. And I'm curious about that. And the same with The Text of Light. It's a film that's mentioned 10 or 12 places in the book, but usually in one sentence amidst something else. And I'm curious about um, if you've tried writing on those, so Text of Light and Pittsburgh trilogy as sort of, um, interesting spots that are skipped over here. Yeah, well, um, the, the Text of Light, I think, is one of his greatest films. He's, he's, I have a history with him that I guess ends with the Egyptians of thinking that he's made a new film that has pushed beyond his previous limits. And so there are many of those along the way. The Riddle of Lumen would have been one, the Pittsburgh films would have been another. I mean, the, the, the Text of Light would have been another. Then he has a bunch of films, and this is a distinction I make in the Chicago Review essay, the main line of his films and what I call the applied films. <laughs> the Pittsburgh films to me are applied. He has all this great stylistic ability and he finds a specific subject to treat. And I, I think of them as far less major than uh, what I think of as the major films. And I'm actually a little bit annoyed at the attention that particularly the act of seeing gets because it has to do with its intense and sensationalistic subject rather than with its style. And, and uh, I don't want to get into a big argument about that. The subject is important. We should look at it. It's a great film. It's only compared to other Brackage films that I, I think it's, it's relatively minor. Um, if there was an occasion to write on them, I would, and I think I could do an okay job. The text of light is a lack. And, uh, you know, if there's ever a second edition of this book, perhaps I should um, uh, approach it because it leads to the Arabics and the Romans and the Egyptians, which I don't really treat in much depth either. So thanks for asking about those. Can I ask a question? Uh, hi, Fred, that, that was a, a wonderful talk. Uh, if this question is at all too, too parochial or, or personal, just let me know. But uh, my understanding is uh, you don't write about murder psalm in the book, but you're perhaps 
writing about murder psalm now or thinking about writing about murder psalm and I, yes. I to hear a little bit about your your analysis or your take on that film and I also understand that you had a disagreement with Tom Gunning about Murder Psalm. And if you want to discuss that, you're free to, but if that's too gossipy, uh, just pass on that part of the question. Well, the only problem with the disagreement is that it was a long time ago. Mm. And so I don't want to hold him to what he said back then. Fair enough. Um, uh, I mean, it was a disagreement. Uh, I think he didn't like it as much as I did. That's about all I can mm. say. Um, the, the panel discussion on brackage that might happen at the Society for Cinema Studies the proposal includes a proposal for me on Murder Song. And one of the other panelists will also write on Murder Song or talk on Murder Song. Um, essentially, my argument is that it's a kind of anti-brackage brackage film. That is that is it's brackage confronting everything that he hates in, in society and that his, his other films try to provide alternatives for. So the, the key moment in the film or the key moments are the models of the brain from this found footage film that he's using. Um, as if you can summarize the brain in a, in a three-dimensional model that you can hold up. And, and the rhyming of that with a ball that a, a little boy throws in a birdbath. And the birdbath has a, a little girl looking at it. And she does something absolutely extraordinary in it. Uh, which is that she's making a kind of brackage film with her eyes. She's blowing something. She's looking at the reflections. She's doing, in my interpretation, exactly what brackage wants us all to do when we look at the world, or what his films at least provide us with instructions for how to do. And that ball, which rhymes with the brain, is splashed right in the bird bath, disrupts, ends her brackage movie, and, and splashes her in the face. <clears throat> so... This, the difference is between the idea that everything is light, as Brackage quotes a medieval philosopher is saying, and, and is infinitely transformable by the imagination, and that, that we live in a world that entraps us in the solid identities of objects which destroy the imagination. And I think Murder Psalm is about the latter, largely, not entirely, but largely. So that'll be my case for it if and when I write on it or give a talk or both. Great, thank you. So I've got a question, if I may. Um, so I, I was thinking about your comment about what Sidney said, that um, that no one has said anything great about Brackage that he hasn't already said about himself. And I think that's incorrect uh, on a number of counts. But I, I want to start, since David James is with us, I want to start by thinking about his, his chapter about um, Brackage, where he framed him as a political filmmaker. Um, something that, that my, I understand Brackage was not entirely in agreement with, something that Annette Michelson thought was a brilliant insight about Brackage's work. Um, and I guess what I want to say is that, you know, you're reading Brackage in, in, in line with his intentions, it seems, and with, with the kind of historical vision of his, of his own work. And I wonder, is there, do you think there's a point now in the 21st century where we can read him against the grain of his own intentions, against the grain of the history that he wrote, against the grain of his own mythologies and thinking about himself bounded in history rather than above history? Well, we certainly certainly should not limit ourselves to his own mythologies. Even if I agree with Sidney, that doesn't mean we can't have insights into Brackage that he didn't have himself. But 23rd Song Branch and his own introduction to it, I think establishes that, that this was a political film, even if he wouldn't like the word. Um, and, and, and I don't see a, a big problem with starting with with what he says about television and so on and 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 that film and and you know and going on further i'm i'm completely open to somebody who disagrees with brackage's interpretations uh if if the point that's being made seems legitimate to me and and decently supported i mean do you have a specific idea well um, yeah sure i mean i i uh <laughs> you know um 23rd Psalm Ranch, Murder Psalm, those are, that's, a, that's a great case in point because it's Brackage engaging with history, which is something that he generally did not do. Yeah. And so it's, it's a fascinating kind of aberration, right? And there's a reason that it's, it's a kind of lightning rod in terms of disagreement between Brackage and his wife, between, between all of us who watched the film and what, what we think it means. Um, we had a talk about this, about the same film at SCMS when we did our conference or our, our panel a couple of years ago on this very topic about 
you know, where does Brackage belong in history and how do we recuperate him or, or process him res, um, responsibly without, you know, bowing to his, um, his own narrative? So I just, my big question is, can we revise how we understand Brackage above and beyond where the story lies, you know, today? I hope so. And I, you know, I, I don't want to limit myself. And also the Sydney statement I was quoting in exactly, it wasn't anything as crude as no important point, points are made. You know, it was more like he's touched on, you know, most of the important insights are things that he's touched on. Um, David James has an article from 30 or more years ago, arguing that Brackage's response to the mass culture, and David, I mean, you have to correct me, was one of separation from it and, and, and of res being resolutely apolitical. And I would say, especially in the current environment today, a film that tells you to look at a chair the way I did is in a sense political. It's asking you to have a more active eyesight. It's asking you not to accept a manufactured object as an object. So, uh, you know, not, every, not everything that's political is political in the narrow sense of it. Thank you. Did I say something? Um, uh, first of all, I was I was uh, totally agreed with Carlos, and I think that the, that uh, whether whether you initially phrased it in an oversimplified fashion, it's absolutely not true that um, Brackage touched on everything that needs to be said about him. Um, but I would uh, pursue this particular issue with two notions of political. Uh, the first thing is that I argue that Brackage was a very political filmmaker, and it was political from precisely the grounds that you said at the end of your last comment, that he makes us look and he makes us look, allows us to look, allows us to look with the kind of intelligence, visual and uh, cognitive that is systematically obliterated in mass media. So in my sense, Brackage is a political filmmaker, and Carlos is right. Uh, in saying that Brackage vehemently disagreed with this. And he wrote me a letter, which I can't find, in which he says, I'm not a political filmmaker. I'm not a political filmmaker. And it was almost like attacking me for saying that he was. But then I agree totally with Carlos that Brackage, with one or two exceptions, um, is totally unaware of the mega politics, the global politics, sexual, no, not, not unaware of sexual politics, but he's just not politically in, engaged. And I think the 23rd Psalm Branch is a great instance of this, which is a film that's supposed to be about the Vietnam War. And in order to do that, he looks at these images from World War II, can't get anywhere with them. And then two thirds of the way, the end of the film says, I can't go on, I can't go on by writing in the film. Okay, including in the film, the very verbal discourse that uh, he theoretically abhors, but then carries on anyway. I don't remember the end. I think he ends up back in Jane's arms or something at the end. But to me, it's a signal instance of Brackage's failure to confront the most important political event of that period, which was the invasion of Vietnam, and it's a contemporary visual representation of it. If he okay. showed <laughs> if, if he'd made his film out of current TV of, uh, of Marines massacring Vietnamese people or of bombing Vietnamese people, then it would be quite different, I believe, than it was by making this anti-Vietnam film, anti-invasion film, by looking at World War II. But did you say you couldn't remember how 23rd Sound Branch ends? No, I don't remember the last bit. And you wondered if he ends up in Jane's arms. Well, it, I, I was facetious and I apologize. No, I know, I know you were being facetious, but I hate to do this after your uh, embarrassing phrase of me, but you're making a bad mistake here, in my opinion. Okay. 23 Sombrance ends with a section called Coda, in which his children or their friends are playing with sparklers. It's absolutely astounding. I, I misunderstood it, I think, when I first saw it. Um, it's in a way a little terrifying because the image of the sparklers are not unlike the images of the explosions in World War II footage. And so it may not be politi political in the way you want, but it does bring us to a present in which violence is somehow found. Um, but that, that's just eternalizing violence. Uh, 
violence yeah. is a property in his, his own children, and that's not surprising, um, but it's also a property, but it's nothing about this specific act of violence and its True. origin in American imperialism. True. I admire that's something that Brackage was never really able to come from. That's true. Except, except indirectly through his critique of the mass media, which I think was part of the invasion of Vietnam. Yeah. Just one, one slightly unrelated comment, although related, the way in which his films are political. Um, yesterday, I'm in New York on a trip photographing, and yesterday I went to something called the uh, Four Freedoms Park, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Four, four Seasons, Four Freedoms Park, designed by the great architect Louis Kahn, and it's on Roosevelt Island. I recommend it. It's a wonderful site. And there's a huge stone plaque that has this speech, an excerpt from the Four Freedoms speech, uh, in which Ad Roosevelt says the whole world should be free from want, free have a free expression, and so on. And I saw many tourists go there, and they would stop and they would take selfies, and maybe two of them would read it. I mean, talk about how far our culture has sunk, the mindlessness of the selfie, whereas here's a text, however unprofound it may be, is certainly worth reading. And finally, I found somebody who was reading it and I started a conversation with him. It turns out he was a Belgian diplomat who works at the UN. So <laughs> <laughs> simply um, proving what's wrong with our culture. You know, something that comes up for me in all of these conversations um, and points, which I'm really invigorated by, is how much our own reading of Brackage's work is influenced by our conversations or our personal connections with him. And that could be through the archive, through reading the letters, or Scott, through your interviews. And I'm just curious if if Scott or others want to talk about the interconnectedness between the way that we're thinking about a film. I mean, there's that age old question, how do you separate the art from the artist? And my response is, well, you don't, <laughs> you can't. Um, and Fred, something that I really appreciate about your work is your intent hyper attention at times, which I love uh, to form and always finding meaning through the film form. And yet we also know that that can't be divorced or separated from the moment that that artist is operating in. I'm wondering if this is something that uh, others would like to speak to or Fred, if you have any thoughts on the matter. Well, I'll let others speak first if they can, if they want to. I mean, certainly there are Brackage films in which the story of how it was made shouldn't be forgotten. He has a rather bad film called The Women that has a kind of obnoxious origin story. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I mean, who knows, you know? I mean, I, don't, I, I think it's a question that can't be answered fully. Obviously, where biography has an effect on the making of a film, you should notice that. His own statement about 23rd Psalm Branch starts with how they got to television and how it was responding to images on television that helped inspire the film. These are all good things to know about because they connect his filmmaking process to his life and in a sense to our lives. Um, it just shouldn't be limited to that. And, and you know we shouldn't necessarily rely on that. I, I think all great films, do present it, you know, there might be some exception, but the best films present us with a text in which you don't have to know bi biography in order to appreciate it. And as time goes on, and I hope Brackage's films continue to get attention, there'll be lots of people who never knew him and haven't read about him and aren't interested who will have legitimate responses. Thank you. Um, Scott, I, I feel like you have so much to say that you're not telling us. I, I, I don't know. I, I A little story is all I can tell you. I Years ago, many years ago, I when I did my first book of interviews, I wanted to interview Brackage because it seemed obvious. Um, you know, he was so important to so many people who care about... <clears throat> 
uh, alternative cinema. And I approached him about it. I, I don't know in what way I must have mailed him. I must have written to him. And he just wasn't interested in being interviewed. Um, and that's fine. You know, I figured he certainly had no trouble making him expressing himself, you know, so I figured, you know, he's perfectly good at saying what he wants to say. So I, I let it go. Um, and then, you know, I would think about it once in a while over the years. And I just, you know, I figured he just doesn't need me to interview him. I've always thought of interviewing as a way of bringing attention to work that otherwise doesn't get it. And Brackett certainly got plenty of attention. Um, and then when I heard he had um, uh, cancer, I thought, okay, wh why wouldn't you ask if he wants? So I, I wrote to him and I said, um, I understand the situation you're in. Are, are you interested in talking about the films uh, for an interview? And he was. Uh, and so that interview that was in Critical Cinema 4 um, took place over the year when he was dealing with the cancer. Um, and um, I mean, one little item that I thought was very illuminating for me as, as part of that interview project, Don Fredrickson had invited Stan to Cornell to show some films. Uh, and I think it was, um, what's the film where he puts the camera in Boulder Creek? Uh, Commingled Containers. Commingled Containers. That was one of the films that was fairly recent at that point. And so I arrived at Cornell and, and I went to uh, Fredrickson's office and Stan was there. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, I thought you didn't like my work. <laughs> Which I thought was the most bizarre, A, that he would give a shit what, you know, I mean, if I didn't like his work, so what? You know what I mean? So many people admire it so much. But I thought it was kind of strange that he that he could possibly think that anybody could not be respectful of his work. You know what I mean? Anybody that knew it, it just seemed very a very strange comment. Um, but you know, I I so that was my I didn't have a lot of interaction with Brackage until that moment, until that year when we talked. You know, maybe once a month. Um, so I just wanted to let him talk as much as he wanted to talk while it was still possible to talk. So um, anyway. I guess it would be that he turned you down initially because he thought you didn't like his work from something that he'd heard from somebody or thought he'd heard from somebody. Because yeah, I think he would have been open to an interview from anyone who liked his work. I, I just, I figured it was, everybody wanted to interview him. I figured he'd probably done interviews and he was writing books and I just you know I thought okay it's fine uh, but uh, yeah I wonder but that just shows how I mean I've had much experience with wrong incorrect film gossip oh. um, you know <laughs> factually wrong about myself about other things so yeah. yeah it's easy for that stuff to take off thanks for that story Scott um I'm cognizant of the time and I'm also very reluctant to end our rich conversation. Um, and I'd love to hear from anyone who hasn't yet spoken, if you feel like you wanna add to the conversation, John, Patrick, Henning, anyone, uh, if you wanna add anything, um, please feel free to do so. Well, people are thinking about that. I'll, I'll put in a little uh, commercial, so to speak, commercial break. So this book will be available uh, January 14th uh, on the iWash website and probably on my own by ebook, which will be $20, and by print book, which will be quite expensive because the print cost alone, not counting postage, is over $30, and then books, bookshops charge a markup. However, the print book is done. And so if anyone who was in on this call wants to purchase it, I can that you can do it through me. It'll be a little messy. You have to send me your address. Uh, we'll have to do a payment by Cash App or Venmo or Zelle, all of which I have. Um, and you let, have to let me know if you want the expedited shipping, which in the US seems to cost $18, or 
or the cheap shipping, which in the US seems to cost $4, um, in which case it'll be either somewhat over 40 or somewhat over 50. I can't remember exactly. Um, but I can order copies to be sent to you. Um, I'm not urging you to do this. Uh, it would not bother me at all if nobody wrote. But I obviously can't offer them for free since there are too many people, and I've already given some away to the few, as I mentioned. Uh, but send me an email and uh, let me know your address and whether you want expedited shipping or not. And, uh, and then I'll, send, I'll order them and send you a bill. And the expedited version comes in a week. I don't know how long the other one takes. Probably they're using postal service, so it could take a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Fred. When I got my copy, I just got so excited. And um, if you are anything like me, you're going to want to get your hands on a bound copy. Um, oh, great. Some people have already pre-ordered through their institutional libraries too, which is wonderful news. Thank you, Sergita. Um, okay, open floor for another few minutes. Uh, any, yes, John. I'll ask a question. Um, thanks, Fred. It was really interesting to to. He, all of this was so interesting. Um, I thought I would just ask you about the hand-painted films because uh, they haven't come up yet in our conversation. And I've been slowly um, here going through all the hand-painted films. I have some here now. And uh, going through them one at a time, it becomes so clear to, to me at least that, you know, there's a tendency to just kind of collapse those all into one thing to just say, and then he did hand painted films for 10 years. And, you know, did, there are a few titles that get cited a lot, you know, maybe they're on the disc or whatever, or, you know, Dante Quartet, major ones. Right. But, uh, but there's a tendency to just think, well, he was sitting in the cafe and the difference between one isn't so different from the other. But when you look at a bunch of them, you realize how different they are and how many different strategies and objectives seem to be going on in the hand-painted film. So I just thought I would ask an open question to you, which is how do you, how do you understand the hand-painted films, the, the distinctions between them, what he was doing in that period? Um, I'll just let you take that however you, you want. Well, I agree with you about the difference and the title sometimes help. I mean, sometimes they're pretty explicit. Black Ice, and there's a story about what that represented, what the film represented. One of my own favorites <clears throat> is The Lion and the Zebra Make God's Raw Jewels. And I have a, an approximate quote from him. Oh, you have that? Um, is that the can? What a coincidence. There it is, right? There. Yeah, it's the can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so there's a quote from him in the book, essentially that it was his response to the BBC, horrible, the horrible BBC, uh, or maybe not BBC, the horrible animal documentaries that his little sons were watching at the time, in which the British voice ac accented narrator explains that it doesn't really hurt the animals as they tear each other apart. Um, <laughs> and, and you can see the palette of the film has some thinking of that in it. So the titles partly reflect a difference, but also are very, there's much more. And I asked him about the titles. He said they're meant to be an end to the film, but not the only possibility. Um, and But that is one indication of the difference. Um, you know, a Dark Night of the Soul is going to be very different from Love Song. Um, a, a, an anecdote, though, that might be worth saying. Um, he explained to me once the uh, huge number of handmade films he made. First of all, the last half of his year in running time is not mostly hand-painted. It's about 50-50. But his explanation was interesting. He says, I have to be making films. No matter what, I have to be making films. And it takes me longer to make a hand-painted film than it does to make a photograph film. And so now these weren't his words, but essentially the cost of filmmaking per year for him is less if he's making more hand-painted films. So that also is part, partly an explanation and is an example about how biography can be helpful, but it should, it doesn't mean the handmade films were not just as great as the others, um, because they are. And I'm, I'm glad you see, that you see the differences between them. Um, uh, Rounds is a particularly amazing short one, for example. There's also one called Garden. Um, uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're just, Chartres series is one of the very greatest, and that's, I write about in the book. 
and that's inspired by Chartres. Um, uh, and, and, and it allowed me to say something to him that he was very happy with when I finally saw Chartres series. Um, I can quote myself, Stan, I've been to Pompeii and I've seen your film with Pompeii in the title. I've, I've met Jane and I've seen her in films. I've been to Paris and I've seen the dead. This is the first film of yours, which I thought was deeply true to some aspect of the subject, namely the Cathedral of Chartres. And I still think that it, it is deeply true. To, so, I mean, there's a film where you know, he has other films where he just goes off in his own direction, and then there's a film where the subject clearly inspired him. Wonderful. Thank you, Fred. Um, well, this is painful to do, but I kind of want to give Ken our final word, unless, Fred, there's anything else you'd like to add about the book, and um, people are thanking you in the chat for your generous offer. Uh, well, thanks, and and I'll you know I'll do what I can to fulfill them fairly quickly. And uh, wonderful. Uh, but you no, know, thanks for everyone, and thanks again to David James for that <laughs> statement, which I will always treasure. <laughs> I think it's shared by many of us. Like I think many of us agree, and we're really grateful for your work. Um, so well, I've been producing Brackage films for most of my life. So if I can, <laughs> if I ought to be good at something, it ought to be that. <laughs> right. Well, I want to, um, I want to end with you, Ken, since you've spent a lot of time with the new book, more than I have had the luxury of doing. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add? Or, or David first, please. Could, could I interrupt just very, very briefly before we go back to Ken and ask Fred to talk a little bit about his photographic work? Because oh, we don't, that would be great. We don't really get to know anything about Fred's own art other than his art of writing and seeing. I thought you might want to mention a little bit the kind of photographs that you've been making, which I've been privileged to watch you making on one occasion. I think it would be if you tell us a little bit about that. Right. I'm, I'm just trying to reduce a little to one or two minutes. Um, first of all, I don't call myself a photographer. Uh, but rather an artist, quote unquote. And the reason for that is that I have no photographic works that consist of a single print. There are always photos either modified or grouped with other photos. Um, and it, it's pretty hard to summarize them. A lot of the older things are on my website. I stopped updating that four or five years ago, but there's a huge number of, of artwork, so to speak, on my website. Lately, I've been working on an extremely demanding project that requires me to shoot a different group of images every day and edit them into place in, in works that represent weeks, months, and years. And it's an attempt to sort of try to pretend that I'm trying to deal with much of the world. And that's why I was at Roosevelt Island yesterday. Um, the, the one thing I thought I could say about them is this, that you won't see them and think that this is brackage related, um, I think. Uh, and I have no idea what he would have thought of him. I, I started a couple of years after he died. But the, the, the thing that I quoted him as saying, look at the street in a new way, that thought, which is in his films in his own eccentric fashion, is a deep inspiration, that, that anything you look at can be interesting. So, I mean, I have photographs of, close-ups of weeds in, in uh, um, a, a vac vacant lots. And I have images of Vancouver Harbor from a spectacular suspension bridge. And I have close-ups of a dirty floor and uh, images of the Grand Canyon, although those have, those have not been yet edited. Um, and so, so my idea is, is to I mean, in a way, it's it's related to what I think Brackage is doing. Help us see better. Don't stop at taking a selfie. Don't even take a selfie at all. Uh, look around you. Um, see imaginatively. See inventively. Seeing itself can be an activity. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I see that Ken is saying no need uh, to have the final word. And Fred, actually, that last statement, I think is a really nice note for us to end on. So thank you so much. Um, 
everyone try to get your hands on the book, uh, electronic or hard copy. It's lovely. Fred, thank you for your time. Ken, thank you for your thoughtfulness. And I look forward to our next virtual book talk event. Thanks so much, everyone. See you all. Thank you all.